Without beauty, writes Wyoming Catholic College professor Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, the good loses its very attractiveness. Beauty is like a mask that guards, veils, and presents the face of the true and the good. They cannot stand on their own feet. The beautiful cannot be banished without drawing into exile sooner or later the true and the good." Close quote. Welcome to the After Dinner Scholar. I'm your host, Dr. Jim Tonkowicz, Director of Distance Learning at Wyoming Catholic College. While Dr. Kwasniewski is Professor of Theology and Philosophy, he also teaches courses on music and art, emphasizing the importance of beauty along with the good and the true. Ignorance of the great works of music, he wrote in The Imaginative Conservative, is as bad for someone who seeks to be educated in Western and Catholic culture as ignorance of Dante and Shakespeare in literature, Plato and Aristotle in philosophy, Augustine and Aquinas in theology. Let me add that Dr. Kwasniewski is also choir master at Wyoming Catholic College, enabling students not only to contemplate great music, but to perform the great music that enlivens and enriches the liturgy. Welcome, Dr. Kwasniewski. Um, in my introduction, I quoted you uh, in something that you wrote. The beautiful cannot be banished without drawing into exile sooner or later the true and the good. Could you explain that and how it relates to music? Joseph Ratzinger once called the beautiful the splendor veritatis, the splendor of the truth. I believe John Paul II also spoke that way. Um, and uh, they, were, they were actually referring to a statement by Hans Urs von Balthasar, who says that uh, the true and the, and the good are both, in a certain sense, uh, naked and defenseless. They need the clothing of the beautiful uh, in order to be fully presented to our gaze and to win us over, to attract us to themselves. Um, and so we, it's not enough just to study the truth. It's not enough just to study doctrinal propositions or syllogisms or great plays. Um, we, we need to immerse ourselves also in manifestations of, of the beautiful. And that, that's particularly true in music. Uh, music moves us in a way that nothing else does, uh, in a way that's m deeper and more immediate, and uh, in some ways even more cosmic, I would say, than texts do or arguments do. Somebody would respond, but isn't beauty in the eye of the beholder? I mean, who's to say what, what's beautiful music or beautiful art? Yes. Well, of course, there's, there's, there's obviously a subjectivity. There is a subjective dimension to beauty. Um, that's why we have different styles of art, different periods, and different perceptions from age to age about what a beautiful figure looks like. Even within Greek sculpture, there can be wide varieties depending upon the period you're looking at. Um, nevertheless, what our students learn when they do uh, the visual arts and the, and the music courses at Wyoming Catholic College is that there are um, principles that you can learn, principles that you see running throughout the works of artists who are considered by nearly everybody to be great artists, uh, whether you're talking about Bach or Mozart or Palestrina, uh, whether you're talking about Michelangelo or Titian or Fra Angelico, whoever the artist is, whatever the medium is, uh, there are great masterpieces that are revered by everybody all around the world, not just Western people, but, but Asians and Africans and so on. You know, there's a, almost, a, you could say, a universal consensus about the greatest works of art. And that prompts us to ask, why is it that these, art, these, these works of art have this, this timeless perennial value to them? Uh, not that there can't be differences of taste. You know, I, some people will prefer Giotto, some people will prefer Michelangelo, but everybody says Michelangelo and Giotto are great. Mm -hmm. or, or Picasso. Yes, well, well <laughs> that's an, uh, exactly. Well, but the thing, the thing that's, that's fascinating to me about modern art and by modern art, I, I'm going to refer here to primarily 20th century art, um, art that's sometimes called modernist art, is that it seems in many cases to be an art of rebellion, an art of reaction, um, not an art pursued in a sense for its own sake, but more for the shock value of, of distorting figures or doing something that's never been done before, the search for novelty, the search for originality, um, even I would say for a creativity that's perhaps proper to God alone, the, the desire to create ex nihilo, which only God can do. Um, it seems like the great artists of, of pre, the pre-modern times, and uh, let's just say up until someone like Picasso, um, they were content to, to learn patiently in a, in a long apprenticeship from the ones who went before them and to look carefully at nature, at plants, animals, human faces, and to depict obviously not always the same way, but to depict 
the beauty that they saw shining in those objects. They wanted to give testimony to that beauty. Now, the, I noticed the first reading assignment in your two-semester music course for our juniors are excerpts from The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis and The Silmarillion by uh, Tolkien. How did Lewis and Tolkien understand the primordial nature of music, and what does that tell us? Yes, oh, these are wonderful, wonderful readings. Um, so if, if you read each, each of those works, The Silmarillion and uh, In the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, presents us with a creation story. How did this material cosmos come into being? And uh, it's not surprising given how, how learned, how erudite both Lewis and Tolkien were in the Western tradition, that they both chose to depict creation as a work of musical composition, as a kind of symphonic exposition. Uh, and, and so what you have in, in Lewis is Aslan uh, pacing back and forth across the barren terrain of Narnia, singing into being all the different uh, plants and animals. And the, the, the children and Uncle Andrew Jadis, that are all watching him do this, they see the correspondence between the songs that he sings and the various uh, entities that come into being. Um, you know, so the stars are a cold, tingling music, you know, and the, the trees are a big, you know, uh, brassy kind of music. You know? So he, he depicts it that way. And similarly with, with Tolkien, I mean, of course, there are many differences. In Tolkien's account, um, you have uh, the, the, the one God who uh, has created many angelic beings, uh, the Ainur, and he, he tells them to start singing. He, he, wants to, he wants them to sing the way he has been singing, and he, 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 he tells them to sing according to what's in their heart, uh, in their mind, and as they sing, they, they come to see that what they're singing are the various creatures that, come, that are going to be created. Uh, afterwards in the pattern of their music. So it, it's of course some, I mean there's, there are really interesting differences between these accounts, but what's important for us in the music class is to see this, this deep insight that the cosmos is musical, that music itself is cosmological, um, that the human soul uh, is, is itself a kind of harmony as the, as the Greek philosopher said, um, and, and that you, know, you see throughout the whole of nature you see mathematical harmonies and rhythms everywhere. And so the connection between music, nature, psychology, theology, it's very profound. And that's what, what Lewis and Tolkien are so effective at bringing out in the narrative way. Well, I know I, I got lost later on in the Silmarillion, but... Uh, <laughs> Easy enough to do. The, the beginning of it, that, that discussion of music, I mean, that's, worth, that's worth buying the book and uh, sitting down and reading it repeatedly. It's absolutely, marvelous. absolutely. Uh, as far as studying music, uh, you assert that great music is as necessary as great books, but wouldn't some argue that, uh, and you kind of addressed that music is kind of an add-on? I mean, philosophy, theology, maybe the hard sciences, uh, these are the vital things. Music is, you know, a hobby. Why is great music so necessary? Sure. Well, I think you, I think you could answer this question in two ways. Um, one is simply to recognize that music was one of the four liberal arts of the quadrivium. Uh, so music understood in a rather philosophical and mathematical way was, has always been part of the Western educational tradition that we and, and other great books colleges follow. Uh, so, so there's always going to, there has to be a place for the, the liberal art of music. But the second aspect is why would one study the history of music, the cultural monuments of music, the lives of the great composers? W what's the point of doing that? Uh, and I think the answer is, 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 is exactly the same as why do we study Dante, Shakespeare, Homer, and all these great authors? Um, it, it's because there's the, the work of art that they produce is a, 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 a tremendous expression of the human spirit, is a tremendous interpretation of reality. When you look at Bach's St. Matthew Passion or Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, these um, works of art are in their own domain just as important to, to know about if we want to understand ourselves and the world and God, ultimately, I would say. Um, as all the great books that you could put together and all the other more textual disciplines, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that rather than calling uh, music classical music, you prefer the term artful music. Mm -hmm. I was curious as to what's behind that. Yes, well, I, that, that, that might be a little bit of pedantry on my part, but I, I, I really insist with the students on speaking with precision about the arts. And so classical music is, as, as people use it nowadays, is an extremely generic grab bag term, you know, that might be useful for a record shop 
where they have a classical section that has everything from Gregorian chant to Arnold Schoenberg or Igor Stravinsky or whatever. But um, in fact, there is a classical period in music that lasts from roughly um, 17, let's say 1770 to about 1828, the death of, of Franz Schubert. Uh, and that's what all the music historians call the classical period. Mm -hmm. They call it that because of its because of its classicism, uh, because of the symmetry and balance and proportionality of the music. It's very reminiscent of neoclassical architecture and enlightenment philosophy. And prior to that, you know, you have the Baroque period and the Renaissance period and the medieval period, all of which have very different types of music. And then after the classical, you have the romantic and the modern period with its plural, pluralism, its, its stylistic uh, pluralism. Um, so really, classical refers to Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I teach them. And, and so if, if you want to talk about this whole realm of great music, I think art music or artful music or serious music, uh, these are all ways that one could talk about it. Mm -hmm. I know you have a special love for sacred music, but not all great musicians were Christians, and not all great music reflects Christian ideas and sentiments. I remember somebody once saying, enjoy Richard Wagner's music, but don't ask a whole lot of questions about his personal life. Should we, uh, or how do we uh, listen to somebody like Wagner, whose music I, I love? You know, you're raising a very good point. Uh, I, this is something that we talk about in the music class. What exactly is the relationship between good art and good morals? Um, there is a relationship, but it's not a one-for-one -one immediate and obvious relationship. Um, what I mean is you can have uh, you can have a composer who is very well trained, natively gifted in music, uh, who writes great string quartets and symphonies, uh, who nevertheless lives a somewhat disordered moral life personally. And on the, on, conversely, you can have somebody who is a devout, pious, upright Christian and attempts to write music and it ends up uh, being trite um, and sentimental. Uh, we see this in religious art all the time. Um, Caravaggio was a great artist, but he, he, he murdered a man and, and he was running from the law. Um, he, he had a very disordered life, um, produced beautiful paintings. Um, a lot of religious art from the Victorian period is, is terribly sentimental, even if the people who produced it were holy people. Um, so the reason why you can have that kind of disjunct is that art is an intellectual virtue that has to do with knowing how to make something well. And as long as somebody's life is not too disordered morally, uh, if they have good training and a good aptitude and, and, and they're able to concentrate on their work, they can produce very great art, even if they're not a holy or moral person. And similarly, somebody with good intentions, if they lack that intellectual virtue of art, how to make beautiful things, it doesn't matter what their good intentions are, they won't be able to produce a great work of art. But there is that, that, that what I like to call a subterranean connection. That is, if, you are a, if you're a womanizer and a drunkard, you're not gonna have enough time to write a great symphony. Right? You, you won't have enough discipline. Your, your, your personal moral dissolution will eventually undermine your art. Um, that's, and I think that actually is the case with Picasso, if I could take one example. Um, but we, we don't have to go into that right now <laughs> extensively. As far as Wagner is concerned, you know, I think Wagner is a fine example of this. He was a despicable person. He was an anti-Semite. He was, um, I mean, he, he had so many offensive opinions that his music was, has even been banned from time to time in, in various places such as, as Israel. However, he was a genius. He was a dramatic genius. Um, he was able to write operas. He, he, had, he had a new approach to writing operas with light motifs. Um, on a level of complexity and sophistication that, it, that uh, really beggars the imagination. And, um, and so one can admire him as a craftsman of music. Uh, at the same time, he, he is, um, as a late romantic, his music does, I think, have a certain amount of self-indulgent emotionalism to it. And that's actually why it became a kind of substitute religion for a lot of people. It became almost a, a surrogate for Christianity. There were, you know, all the people who would go on pilgrimage to Bayreuth to watch the ring cycle and be completely immersed in it. Um, these are people who almost found in Wagner a sort of a musical messiah. Um, and I think that that's, that's a sign that there's maybe something imbalanced or some, something wrong with the music. It, it doesn't lead one back to well, it, it certainly doesn't lead one, I think, to the true God. Um, I think it's, it's kind of a false religion in some ways. So I admire him as a musician, 
but I wouldn't want to steep myself in his music because I actually think that that would start to to affect my character in, in, in a negative way. Well, it has kind of a funny hypnotic quality yes, to it. Yes, precisely, precisely. I think hypnotic is a perfect word. Um, if some of our listeners want to start exploring the beauty of artful music, uh, where should they begin? Yes, um, well, I, you know, not every town or every city is fortunate enough to have a classical radio station. Here I'm using the word classical in its uh, usual, typical sense. But, um, but if, if you do have a classical radio station, most of these stations tend to be rather conservative in their choices. They're not playing all kinds of odd, um, super dissonant modern music. They're usually playing um, Mozart or Beethoven or Bach or Handel. Uh, and and I th what they're playing are, is the music that's lovely and that people really enjoy listening to. Um, so putting on that radio station uh, when you know when when you're working and doing something that doesn't you know perhaps require intense concentration, that that would be a good idea. But I also think that I, I say this to the students: we need to start with works that have pleased countless people for centuries because they're probably going to please you as well. Um, so Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Mm -hmm. It is such a lovely piece of music. It's so, so refreshing, so lively, vivacious, um, delightful in every way. Uh, so v Vivaldi's Four Seasons, uh, Handel's Messiah, you know, it's, it's impossible to think of a better work. And not just at Christmas time, although that's when it's traditionally performed, but any time during the year. It's a wonderful reflection on the, the life and death and resurrection of Christ. Beethoven, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I mean, it's a little cliched because that opening motif, but if you get past the opening motif into the development of the first movement and then into the second, third, and fourth movements, um, when I showed, I, I showed a performance of that to the juniors this past year, and I mean, they, they were completely uh, riveted by it. They just loved it. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's good in a way to just, uh, in a way to ask yourself, what are the most popular classical works? Mozart, G minor symphony, symphony number 40, or symphony number 41. These are all just, uh, you know, wonderful pieces. Good. Well, it's a rainy day here in Lander, and it makes me want to go sit in front of a fire and uh, <laughs> listen to some uh, classical music. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Great music grabs us, lifts us up, leaves us enraptured, and sticks in our minds. Interesting how the verbs we use to describe the experience of music testify to music's inherent power. Music, wrote C.S. Lewis, is the thing known in the present life which most strongly suggests ecstasy and infinity, close quote. Through beauty, music invites us and draws us toward goodness, toward truth, and toward God. We hope you're enjoying these podcasts, and if you are, will you take a moment to tell a friend, or maybe four, about the After Dinner Scholar? Thanks so much. For Wyoming Catholic College, this is Dr. Jim Tonkwich.